Welcome in folks. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit. Today's a teaching video, but a very different teaching video than many of the videos I do where I talk, teach you about things in the market and things like that. Today's business related. We're going to speak about Hungry Bowl. Hungry Bowl was an app I had a few years ago and it ended up costing me a lot of money, as in about $750,000 lost. It was my second biggest failure publicly ever. And so in this video here today, I, I wanted to speak about why, now that I'm so far removed from it and I can look back at everything, I say, why was this such a big failure? And then we're going to talk about why 1000X, on the other hand, is such a big success. Because I learned so much coming from the Hungry Bowl project that then I ended up being able to do 1000X and it's a huge success. And so I thought we'd kind of get into this. I think this is a video and not a lot of people know the truth around a lot of things. And so I'm just going to talk a lot about a lot of the truth around this whole situation and what really transpired, how it started, how why it failed, those sorts of things. Because we've got a lot to go through in this one here today. I think this is a video that I think I think my a lot of my core fans are going to enjoy this. I think you guys will enjoy this video here today. I think there's going to be a lot of entrepreneurs that might be watching this or people that might end up wanting to start a business that I think are really going to enjoy this here today. And I think there's going to be some folks that might get some inspiration from today's video as well. But they're definitely going to teach you a lot of lessons so you don't have to lose $750,000 on nap someday. And you can kind of understand what went wrong there so you can go ahead and uh, hopefully never never uh, face that, right? Which honestly is if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to have a lot of failures. And especially if you're doing big stuff and you want like – I don't know anybody that's ever been like really, really done it big as in, you know, many, many, many millions of dollars behind them or billions of dollars. I don't know anybody that hasn't had a lot of failures behind them as well. You're going to fail a lot. And when you run a business or businesses, you're going to have failures. It's a guarantee. There's no way around that. I, there's not one person. There's not one person on the billionaire list that doesn't have a long list of failures. Not one. Keep that in mind. Not one. They all have a long list of failures. But through those failures, you can learn a lot that you can then ad adopt for future projects that can hopefully become a success. So, you know, if, if you are somebody that enjoys this here today and this video is not for everybody, smash a thumbs up. Let me know in the comment section if you get a lot of value out of today's video because I hope you do. It's a different subject. Don't worry. I'll be back to talking stocks and talking the market before you even know it. But I felt like talking about this today. And uh, I'm kind of divulging a lot of details around this and telling you a little bit about why one was a success, why one was a failure. So hope you enjoy this video here today, okay? So let's go to the kind of origin story. Like how did the Hungry Bull app, which we had on iOS, we had it on Android, how did it even come about? Like how did something like that even happen? Well, it all started in 2021, where pretty much all bad ideas came from. <laughs> 2021 was a special time. If you were around then, you know what was going on. It was a clown market, clown valuations. We were all caught up into it. Everything seemed to be having crazy valuations on it. Robinhood when IPO. It was a crazy valuation. It, it, it was just like people were valuing companies based upon how many customers they had. Not even if they were paying customers. It was just about like how many users you have and things like that. Right? And so I was networked back then with a lot of big other finance influencers. right? And so... And the idea was kind of like, let's make a big finance app and sell it for a big valuation someday, right? And if you can kind of already put pieces together, you're already going to see where flaws are at here. But that was kind of the idea, like, we're going to create this app, we're going to all promote it, and it's going to be, you know, a big success and those sorts of things, right? But no one was really willing to take on the challenge. And so I basically, you know, was kind of like, I want to take on this challenge. And so that was how Hungry Bull was born. And it was a free app. And our, our idea was it's going to be free to use, but we're going to have a ton of users use this thing. And the more users that use it, the more valuable it is, even if we're not making money. Because, you know, back then, the Fed funds rate was at near zero. Everything was getting crazy valuations on it. So it's like, let's just get a ton of users. Then we can maybe flip it and sell it someday. And I could act as a VC for this since I had a lot of money behind me. So it it made a lot of sense on surface level given the particular time frame we were in at that particular time, right? But there was fatal flaws. And looking back now, the problems emerged right from the jump. And there were several of them. One, I hope you noticed the problem right off the bat. Whenever you get into a business and your first focus is on money and selling a business rather than on creating a great product and service, 
you already lost. You're likely never going to be able to make a bunch of money and sell a product uh, to some other company or some other business or VC or whatever. You're likely never going to be able to accomplish that if you don't focus on the product first. So whenever you go to start a business, yeah, you got that's got to be in the back of your mind. Like, how are we going to make money from this and those sorts of things? But you got to focus on the product or service you're delivering first. Make sure that's there. And that doesn't matter whether you're starting a car detailing business or whether you're starting an app. At the end of the day, it's got to be product focus first, and we worry about the money second. We'll figure that out, right? If you don't do a great job detailing somebody's car, you're probably not going to even get another chance to detail that car again for that customer. They're probably not going to have any good things to say. If you're great at detailing a car, they're going to probably tell 10 of their friends and their family members, right? And you're probably going to have so much business, it's not even funny. So when the thought goes to money and selling first, you're already going to be in trouble. Second thing is, my number two that was working with me at that particular time, he wasn't really bought in on the idea. And that was a huge, huge blow. That was a huge blow at that time. Because I can tell you, he, you know, he was going to have to be the one that really made stuff work. And when I say made stuff work, I'm talking about finding the developers, creating the team, creating this, you know, the extra strategy, doing a lot of the back end work because I don't have time for that, right? I got to focus on the portfolios. I got to focus on the private stock group and I got to focus on making YouTube videos and I got a family and all those sorts of things. So I just don't have time to be a full-time CEO of a business, right? So I needed my number two to really step up and he wasn't really bought in. So I was, you know, we already had two big problems right off the bat. Okay. Third problem. I had to compromise from the jump on the product because here's the thing. Okay. I had a bunch of other influencers into the project. And everybody's throwing me this idea. Oh, you should do this. You should do that. You should do this. And so I'm already thinking like I've got to like compromise to keep everybody happy. So whenever I'd come out with like, you know, here's where I want this to go or that to go, I always kind of was thinking about <clears throat> what somebody else told me and taking that into account, right? Rather than just kind of being a dictator and just being like, we're doing this. It's kind of like a compromise. It, but sometimes when you compromise, like, it doesn't like maybe nobody's happy in that situation because one person didn't really get their full way. If I didn't get my full way, like there's comp, there's, there's compromise happening there, but it's probably not the ideal situation, right? And so you can kind of create a mixture of <clears throat> things that don't ultimately work. So we had problems emerge right from the jump, right from the jump that I can say, I can look back now and say the project was destined for failure right from the jump, given these three major, major things here, right? Now, as the process goes along, we had problems emerge. The product launch was about two months behind when we were supposed to launch a product was was already a huge blow. Because when you're, you know, getting everybody hyped about it, getting everybody excited about it, and then you have to wait, 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 wait. That's already like a huge kind of letdown there, right? Number two, the product at launch was not that great. There was lots of issues. There was bugs. And... So we were late in getting the product out. And when we did finally get the product out, there was a lot of issues that needed to be addressed. I mean, a lot of issues. And so it was just like a huge, but it was kind of like one of those things like, do we wait another two, three, four months and try to perfect what we have um, and lose maybe even more hype and excitement about it? Or do we get the product out there? And so that was a very tough decision to, to make there, right? Then some influencers became, I would say, disinterested over time because the product was several months late when the product was launched there was plenty of issues and so i can say like we lost some of the interest there right and additionally trying to attract new influencers to it was also tough because we were behind on schedule we had issues a lot of those sorts of things and usage for the app ultimately peaked in the first month or two when it was first being promoted and whatnot and so that was a very bad sign to see usage peak very early on that means people didn't really like the product overall, right? They tried it out and that was about it in in regards to that. And then the final death of this came from cost spiraling out of control, which when you're running an app, anything with developers, costs can spiral out of control intensely. Second, by the time the product was at, we actually did get it to actually a pretty respectable, good place where people actually liked it. We had the conference calls feature on there and a bunch of other features that people actually started to enjoy. But the problem was it was too late to get a lot of the creators back interested in it again, like we needed it to, uh, to really promote it. And then also a lot of the customers were not that interested in it either because they had been like, I already tried it out. Wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't up to, up to par. It wasn't up to standards. And so a lot of people aren't going to give it a second chance. 
And so that's what ended up happening there, which was not good. Then we had data provider issues, which was a bad problem as well. And then we also lost key developers to some crazy offers that they got from other companies. And I might have a good amount of money behind me, but I don't have Google money. I can tell you that. I don't have meta money. There's different levels of money, right? And so if a developer gets hired somewhere else that they start making 300K, 400K or something, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, you know, I can't. I can't do that. It's just the numbers start getting too big, especially when you need many different developers on a project. So we lost some key developers as well. And so ultimately in 2022, made the decision to shut it down. It was a $750,000 loss in regards to that, which was, you know, no fun, but it was a valuable bunch of lessons I learned. And there's so many other key, I think you can kind of say minor details that I also learned in that project as well, right? So then time goes by, And I don't want to touch anything software related. I mean, nothing. And I put it here, like, it's like a relationship scar. If you ever had a bad breakup or relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a lot of times coming out of that, you don't even want to think about dating, right? Do do, do you get me? Like, there's got to be some people watching us right now. You went through a bad relationship in the past with a guy or with a girl and like, It was so bad that it scarred you for a while. And you didn't, even when you got out of that relationship, you didn't want to date anybody, right? Come on. I know some of you guys are out there that you went through something like that, right? And that's the way I kind of felt about after Hungry Bull was I was so kind of scarred by the situation. I didn't want to touch anything software related for a while after that, which, you know, after $750,000 loss, you can kind of understand why that uh, would be, right? And obviously the stress that went along with that, obviously having to let go of people that were working on the project, like all that stuff sucks, man. It sucks so bad. It's a lot of huh? It's a lot of fun when you have people coming to work for you and like that's an exciting day and exciting moment. But when you have to let people go, oh, it's such a bad feeling. It sucks, man. It's it's the worst part of business by a mile. I would say like the money being lost is one thing, but like, you know, when you have to let people go that you'd love to continue to work for you and work on this project, it, that's painful. Very, very painful. So it was, I was scarred for a while, for quite a while. Right. But then I started to kind of think a little bit about building something that could save me a lot of time because you don't understand in the stock market, it could be so time consuming, so time consuming, like to do the research work really necessary on companies it's very time consuming process. And so being that I'm tight on time, I was kind of thinking like, could I build something that wouldn't cost like a crazy amount of money? Like wouldn't cost me millions of dollars to build, but build something that could help me make decisions faster, better, and in a much more time efficient manner. Right. And so that's where the idea for, for thousand X ultimately came from. And so I thought, what if we created a software in which we could have all these different metrics, all laid out exactly how I want them laid out, right? Trailing 12 month P, forward P, two year forward P that almost any, no one else even provides that, right? Trailing 12 month earnings per share growth, current year, and had all in order exactly how I want it. I'm like, this could save me so much time because before I would have to use multiple different stock market softwares and then go to multiple different pages back and forth, back and forth, back button, back over here. Okay, uh, what's your earnings per share growth? Okay, now I got to go to this other page over here. I got to flip over here. Such a pain in the butt. And then also, like, you know, it's hard to remember off the top of my head where stocks usually kind of typically trade at for all these different ratios and things like that, right? Like PE is kind of easy one to, to remember. You kind of usually think around like a 20-ish. PE is usually roughly normal for the market, right? If you're undervalued, you'll be under 20. If you're overvalued, you might be well above 20. But like stuff like that, I can remember, but there's a lot of metrics. I just like, wait, what, how, how much do companies usually grow? So creating this just started to save me a ton of time. And then I kind of thought about advanced metrics, looking at like trailing 12 month versus the next 12 month earnings per share growth, looking at two year stack expected earnings per share growth. Like people aren't providing these sorts of things. A two year stack expected revenue growth. Because before I would have to do all these calculations myself. If I want to see what it, you know revenue growth was likely looking at like for the next two years on a stack basis, I would have to calculate the number. Okay, there's number, there's number. It's just a pain in the butt, right? Peg ratio, return on equity, price to book, price to free cash flow, free cash flow yield, dividend yield, all this stuff. It just like started saving me so much time. It was ridiculous. And then the comparison. Oh my gosh. You want to talk about something that would take so long to do? 
trying to compare one stock versus another stock, it took forever. Because you got to understand, like, you know, I don't care how much money you have, everybody has a finite amount of money. Everybody. Not one person in this world doesn't have a finite amount of money. I don't care if it's Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, everybody has a finite amount of money. So you're kind of considering, like, should I buy this stock? Should I buy Meta? Should I buy Google? Should I buy Apple? Right? And then trying to play the whole comparison game about trying to figure out forward P, then calculating what the two-year forward P is for this company. So I'm thinking, thinking a couple of years out as well versus another company going back and forth. Okay, the earnings per share growth expected for this company, but what about the last year? What about, I mean, my gosh, like just comparing two companies versus each other, that's like a 30 minute to an hour long process. Literally 30 minutes to an hour long. Never mind if I'm trying to compare three companies, it's not happening. It's not happening. So it's such a pain in the butt, right? And so we ended up creating the software where literally in a matter of less than a second, it gives me all the readings right there and I'm saved an hour of time each time because that is so time consuming. Then I had my crappy spreadsheets and I got to say bye-bye to those spreadsheets because at the end of the day, those spreadsheets were garbage and they took forever to do my bull case, my bear case, because whenever I, I research a stock, I do five cases around it. I'll do a ultra bear case. I'll do a bear bear case. I'll do a base case, which is my expectation. I'll do a bull case and an ultra bull case. Okay. And so when I would do it in my spreadsheets, it took so freaking long. Like I'm talking so long to do it. I could have probably done a little faster if I used Excel, but I would use the Apple numbers, which is in my opinion, not a great product from Apple. But uh, the moral of the story is it took me so freaking long to do all this crap. And I would even save the spreadsheet so I could kind of plug and play numbers, but it still was so time consuming. And so we created this valuation model that I can adjust all the numbers exactly how I want, revenue growth, whatever I want, right? Net income growth, whatever I want. It's going to spit me out what the net margins are and what the earnings per share is, right? P ratios. And I don't have to worry about entering on all the info. The revenue that's expected for this year is already there, right? The net income for this expected this year is already there. The, uh, you know, earnings per share is already there. The net margins are already there. That's so easy. It's so easy. Like this, now I can run a valuation model in less than a minute. And before, it took me at least 5, 10, 15 minutes just to one, you know, run one valuation model. I can run all five scenarios that I'm thinking in a matter of, I mean, gosh, in a few minutes. And so that was kind of a thought around that, right? And then it just kind of like, let me just create a one-stop shop for everything I need. Earnings calls all in there, like instead of having to go to company's investor relations page, type in a ticker symbol. That's an idea I got from the Hungry Bull project, right? Where just kind of aggregating all the earnings calls into one place and just being able to type in a ticker symbol and in a matter of a second, it pops up, listen to it, adjust the speed, 1.5X, 2X, all those sorts of things. SEC filings aggregated all in there, right? And then valuation model, the financials, the charts feature, compare, search. I mean, just made things so much easier. So in terms of 1000X, why it's such a big success is I focus on building what I want. And I've noticed in life when I usually focus on what I want, it goes pretty damn good. Rather than focusing on like trying to think like, what would other people want to do, right? What would other people want to do? Like even with my YouTube channel, it, it's a thriving channel. We do phenomenal, obviously, and uh, the rewards speak for themselves over the years, right? But I just create the type of videos that I want to watch. I create the type of videos that are in-depth that I want to watch. Not like, oh, maybe the audience is looking for this, right? Oh, the, the sweet spot for making videos is 8 to 15 minutes, so I better be 8 to 15 minutes. I don't care. Like, I, I'm like... This is what I want to watch. This is the sort of video, this is the sort of content, this is the sort of in-depth stuff that I would personally enjoy, right? And so I, I adapted that and used that for 1000X. And so we, we took it from Hungry Bull, which was, you know, we're just going to have a billion users to try to create something that they all love, to this thing that I don't need. I don't need a million users on, on, on 1000X. I don't, need 10, I don't even need 10,000 users on 1000X. Like, and it's a massive success. And so there's a huge divergence there between like the thought process on Hungry Bull versus the thought process on 1000X. And it's like night and day. And 1000X is like this massive success. And I could tell you Hungry Bull was just, you know, a very costly failure. Others, people love it. And hold on. No, and also in terms of 1000X, I got to make sure I say a huge thank you to the developer team that's obviously been working on the project and continues to work on the project. We're working on more features and and different tweaks to things that um, you know are going on literally today. So very exciting around that, including adding a few new chart features. Got to say a huge thank you to Andre, huge thank you to Trevor 
for making this project so successful because I can tell you, I couldn't have done it alone. That's the thing with something like this. Like you can't do it alone. Like I might be the brainchild behind it and kind of like the, the director of the movie. And I'm like, we need to do this, 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 this. But in terms of am I the one that's actually doing the code on the back end? Heck no. Am I the one that's, you know, run the day-to-day -day operations and working with the developers directly? No. And so, you know, that's Andre, that's Trevor. The developer team is doing a great job and just continues to, um, you know, surprise to the upside. And so, what was it like to have Hungry Bull and, and have it be a failure? And I think that's a fair question, right? So my thought on failures, you know, as kind of like a public figure, is I learned how to deal with it a long time ago. And I learned also, like, you're going to have failures. Before I even ever stepped on YouTube, which I got on YouTube and got in the spotlight uh, back in 2016. But before I got on YouTube, like, I already... I had known by that moment you're going to have failures if you're running business, if you're investing. Like, it's guaranteed. And so when I did have that failure with Hungry Bull, right, I was able to get over it and not dwell on it. And that's the biggest thing I can say for me and that might help you guys out is you can't dwell on your problems. Learn from them. Like, you make mistakes. Like, it is, it's part of the process. This is life. You've got to make mistakes. There's a, there are some people out there that are definitely uh, very, they're ext they're frightened to make a mistake. I mean, absolutely frightened. It like eats them alive. Like even the thought of like failing at anything, like, oh my gosh. And so they, they can't do anything. They're like in this little box and they're going to be in that little box for the, their entire life, right? And their whole life is going to go by and they never actually stepped out and actually like did anything. Um, and, and that's fine. Like, you know, people live their own life however they want. But I just knew, like, for me, it's not a life I want to live. Like, I want to try to do some big stuff here. And I got big goals and, you know, where, where we're headed and those sorts of things. And so, for me, failure, being in the public light, you know, even, I, this is another reason I think everybody should do sports. I did sports for years and, you know, played tackle football for five years. Whew, you know, my high school back in those days was extremely successful. And so... When we went to play a game, those stands were packed, and it was standing room only. They, I mean, just people lined up on the fences and everything, just mayhem. And when you're playing in front of a lot of people, every mistake is going to feel, like, big for you, especially as a high school kid. It's going to feel, like, huge. Like, you miss a tackle, you're like, oh, my gosh, all these thousands and thousands of people just watch me miss this tackle. Like, how embarrassing. Your coach is chewing you out. You're getting criticism from him. You're getting criticism from your teammates. And so to face criticism and in, in people laughing at me or not, like, big deal. Like, it's part of the process, right? And so I, I understood that very early on. And so that's how, at the end of the day, like, I'm going to have failures in the future, right? Not every stock I pick is going to go up. Many of them do outside of those 2021 stocks that were garbage when we were in the, the uh, you know, the, the clown market there. But you look at my track record outside of that, it's ridiculously successful. And everybody knows that. And that's why the public account's got the numbers it's got, right? And so, um, you know, business, I'll have other failures in the future. I'll do things that don't work out and that's fine. Like, that's part of life. And, you know, as, as being somebody, you want to be able to look back at your life, I think, as life goes on and be able to say you actually did stuff, right? And you actually, like, tried and you failed here, but you had a success here. And that didn't quite work, but this worked over here. Because I think that's kind of the, my opinion is that's living life. Like, that's actually living life. You know, does that make sense? Like, let me let that sink in. Like, that's really living life. Like living life to me is not just like doing the, the least possible and getting by and, you know, retiring at 75 so you can sit in your recliner with your 700K that you got in your little portfolio. Because I can tell you, 700K ain't going to be that much when you're 75. I can tell you that much. Okay. And so like that to me is not life. Like life is like, like bigger than that. It should be grander than that. It should be much better than that. Um, life should be you being able to do what you want, wake up when you want, work when you want, uh, go on vacation when you want, do all those sorts of things. But you got to put yourself in position to do that. And you have to invest for yourself to get to those sorts of places, right? Because doing the average is going to get you average results. And that's what you have to understand. Work an average job, 
put an average money, amount of money away will only get you average. It's not going to get you to the promised land. It's not going to get you to a, a life, uh, you know, that you really want to live. The type of, I could live in any house. I could buy any car, you know. I go on vacation anywhere. It's not going to get you there. Average doesn't get you there, right? You have to go way above that. You have to create products and services that are of extreme value. You have to make investments that become extremely valuable, right? And be able to see those before other people see those to get those sorts of opportunities. Like I saw with Elf and, and Palantir and Tesla and Meta and many of these other companies, right? And so that's the name of the game in regards to that. And so, you know, failure is what it is. Like you just have to on to the next one, on to the next one. I never shy away from those things. It is what it is, right? And so um, I think you could take that for your own life and adapt that to your own life a little bit. But that entrepreneur type lifestyle, the investing for yourself lifestyle is not for everybody though. It's not, right? Like we do have to admit that. A lot of people are a little too scared to do that, which I understand, right? You know what else is scary to me? Um, you know, when I see the people rock climbing with, with no ropes or anything, to me that's freaking scary, Right? I couldn't pay me enough to do that. Oh, heck no. If you told me there was a trillion dollars at the top of that mountain and all I had to do was climb it with, with, you know, no ropes, I'm not doing it. I don't don't care. You could give me all the money in the world. It wouldn't matter. I wouldn't do it, right? Because I'm not interested in that. And so the same exact thing could be applied to like entrepreneurs, to investors who invest for themselves. Some people look at that and be like, Oh, hell no. I'm not going down that route. I'm going to have to lose money sometimes. I'm going to have to have failures. I'm going to have to be able to get over those failures without, you know, let's say going to substances and things like that, right? You have to like be able to move on. And so that's not for everybody. I can just tell you that much. Oh, no. Oh, no. It is not for everybody. And so, you know. That, that's kind of the moral of the story in regards to that. But if you want to live that sort of life, you can. Just understand you're going to have failures. You're going to have to overcome them. You're going to have to learn from them. And then you can use that in the future, right? Every, every success or failure, there's a lot to be learned there. And you're going to learn much more from your failures than your successes. I can also tell you that. The stocks that don't work out, the businesses that don't work out, you will learn more from those than you do from your successes. I can 100% tell you that. As somebody that's had more success than I ever dreamed of having, right? Like, I shouldn't say that because I always did imagine myself very successful as far as a lot of those things go. But in, and also when it goes back to kind of like, you know, criticism or people laughing at you and all those sorts of things, I also bring it back to what do those closest to you, what do they think about you? That's always really mattered to me the most is what do family members think about me? What do my close friends think about me? What do people that work with me have to say about me, right? What do those folks have to say? And I'm not talking about in front of my face. I'm talking about behind closed doors. That matters to me way more than like a public criticism or something like that, right? Or people laughing at me, making fun of me, like, oh, you failed, you lost $750,000, you bum on that project. Like, that that's just me living rent free in people's heads like holy smokes i should be paying for that (laughs) for living in their heads like that's incredible but when it comes to when it comes to like the people i actually care like really what they think that's the people that are closest to me that's my family members my close friends all those sorts of folks if they were to judge me i you know that that's something i'm like okay oh man like what did i do wrong here like what the heck but outside from people i don't even know like strangers like, okay, you want to laugh at me? Laugh at me, okay? You know, you want to praise me? Praise me. Like, do what you want to do. Um, I'm not going to make up your mind in regards to that, but I'm going to continue to do my thing. So, all right, guys, appreciate you joining me as always. Much love. And uh, I feel good, like, just speaking about this subject, kind of teaching what went wrong in that project, why 1000X is a big success, and, and those sorts of things. So, it's all fun, man. Life, it can be a lot of fun. It's, a, it's you know, a lot of work. As long as you can manage the stress that goes along with different situations, like I live for those stressful moments too. I gotta say that, like that's that's to me that's I love that. I love 2022, believe it or not. Like 2022, I got wrecked, right? I lost a mill on the chef, 750k on Hungry Bull, had to shut that down. Uh, Tesla stock got wrecked. Meta stock was getting wrecked. Everything was getting wrecked, right? 
I love 2022. It was so much adversity, so much, you know, ah, man, like that's the moments. That's the moments. Those moments to me are, you know, they're, they're, to me, it sounds kind of crazy. They're actually a lot of fun. Uh, you know, maybe the making the money part is even more fun all of the success. Like the last few years have been and like prior to, you know, obviously 2022. Like, but then, you know, another thing I can look at is also like, I already won. I think that also helps me out as well. Like I already won the game. So now everything really from here is kind of like side missions when you kind of really think about it. Because, I mean, I had $200,000 before I was 25 net worth. And I started at 18 years old as a dishwasher at Einstein Bagels making seven fifty. My come up job next up was Walgreens making eight twenty five an hour in the photo department. And from there I was working overnights at Quick Trip. And I just kept climbing and kept climbing, right? And so for me, for me, like to live the life I live, I already won. I already won. So I kind of look at it from that perspective as well. And I'm like, okay, if I take a loss, if I make a bad move, whatever. Like, I already won. The game's already done. Like, now it's just extra, right? It's just extra. Like, when you can already do all the things you'd ever want to do, then it's just extra. You're just on side missions now, right? You're just trying to do the next thing and the next thing. And so I can relate to people that already became, like, super successful and they keep pushing because I'm like, I, I get it. Like, it's just, it's fun at that point, right? You already won. You already played the game and you won. Now we're just doing other fun stuff, right? So anyways, moral of the story is keep grinding, keep putting in work. Life's here and then it's gone. So make sure, you know, you make the most of it while you're here, right? All right, guys, much love and have a great day.